Welcome to the Mormon Yeshiva. Uh, this presentation is going to be one in a series of presentations regard, called Beholding Eternity. And it's, we're going to be discussing the prophetic path of the Book of Mormon. Um, in this particular case, uh, what we want to do is take a, look, a closer look at the Book of Helaman. You know, a lot of times people, when they, uh, when they look at the Book of Helaman, they actually read right over it thinking that it's primarily just a chapter regarding wars between the Nephites and the Gadianton robbers. So the Book of Helaman is actually probably one of the most neglected books in the Book of Mormon. While on the Peshat, or literal level, we are given a story that appears to be an account of the social and political struggles between the Nephites and the Gadianton robbers, the book is actually encoded with the ancient prophetic teachings of ancient Israel. It is these teachings which hold the keys to entering in by the gate, becoming sanctified, and revealing the tongue of angels and the secret of the Messiah. So let's begin to uncover the prophetic path. And to do that, we have to start, we have to actually start in the last chapter of Alma, which precedes the book of Helaman. And in this, we have a, a very, very interesting ancient teaching that is being couched. And it's the mystery of the man named Hagoth or in Hebrew, Hagot. And it came to pass that Hagot being, Hagot being an exceedingly curious man, therefore he went forth and built him an exceedingly large ship on the borders of the land Bountiful, by the land Desolation, and launched it into the West Sea, by the narrow neck which led into the land northward. Interestingly, the way the Nephites begin to construct their, the, the writer of the Book of Mormon, the Nephites construct their layout of the geography is also an astronomical as well as a layout, it's a layout of, of an astronomical picture, but also a layout of the Tree of Life, with the land Bountiful uh, being, you know, in the center part of the land, with the land Desolation being northward, and the Sea West and the Sea East, the Sea North and Sea South, um, symbolizing, you know, those directions symbolizing attributes of the Tree of Life. That's another, that's actually another presentation. <clears throat> But there's been much speculation about the man Hagot, who built ships and set sail with many people into land northward. Some say he's the father of the Polynesians, while others suggest he and his people were the ancestors of varying other nations. You know, whatever the genealogical implications the story may have or, you know, or be, um, there is a much more ancient and hidden teaching associated with this exceedingly curious man. So the setting of Hagot story actually commences in the preceding verse. And it came to pass that in the 30 and 7th year of the reign of the judges, there was a large company of men, even to the amount of 5,400 men, with their wives and their children. And they departed out of the land of Zarahemla into the land which was northward. In the Israelite prophetic tradition, the direction north corresponds with the concept of strength and power. It was the abode of the powers and principalities of heaven. It was the world of the angelic. Um, while the literal story portrays a group of people who built ships to sail to the land northward, the underlying prophetic story is about a group of people who, ascend, who transcend the natural man and woman and ascend to the upper worlds. The phrase curious man, or sometimes you'll see curious workmanship, or just the word curious, is actually a prophetic marker in ancient Israel and also used frequently in the Book of Mormon that connects the man Hagot to Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness with specific reference to the ephod of the high priest. And the curious girdle of the ephod, curious meaning not necessarily like mysterious, but the fine or exceedingly well made or of you know masterful artistry if you will uh, which is upon it, it says that the curious girdle of the ephod if the ephod which is upon it shall be the same according to the work thereof even of gold of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen exodus 28 8 that's its first mention there where you see that that their reference in connection with the ephod in other words the usage of the description curious man is a marker that we're about to explore very ancient teachings connected with the temple of God. The next word of importance is the meaning of the name Hagoth itself, 
besides carrying a relationship to the word Haggai, meaning a festive or an ingathering of people, which is very descriptive in itself in that he did gather groups of people to carry them to the land northward, uh, leading also to a connection and reference to the appointed times of Israel, there's an even more important and direct meaning connected to Hagar. Psalms 49.3 My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. Here the word for meditation is the Hebrew word hagot, and it comes from the root word haga, meaning in a sense to growl or to meditate, or like the growling of a lion. And the usage of the word would draw the Israelite reader to an even more ancient teaching called the roaring of the lions. These concepts were related to a discipline of mental and emotional uh, practices that the you know the ancient schools of the prophets would actually use uh, to help discipline themselves to connect with God. And it's connected actually and, and finds its origins with Enoch. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord and the earth trembled. And the mountains fled, even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course. And the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness, and all nations feared greatly. So powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. Moses 7.13 So, Rather than just being an account of a Nephite who built ships to carry away his people to another land, the account of Hagot is, is being in included to preserve some of the most ancient teachings instructing us in the means of the transformation of our soul, Nefesh, into a vessel that, be, that, can be, that in a sense becomes a celestial vessel to follow the ancient paths of people like Enoch, Melchizedek, Alma, and those 5,400 souls, including men, women, and children, who went to the land northward. So, in a sense, we're being given a hidden teaching regarding an ancient discipline of, well, in Hebrew, although in English we use the word meditations, in Hebrew it's actually more closely to the bond, uh, idea, it's connected to the idea of bonding with God. Whereas oftentimes in, in ancient Near East uh, or at Eastern and like Oriental meditation, you'll hear things of like, like connected to like say transcendental meditation, where they go to a state of nothingness. The Hebrew concept of meditation isn't going to a state of nothingness per se, as much as is a state of being bonded with God himself, a state of oneness. <clears throat> so the record continues, and there's a little bit more going on here at the end of Alma that introduces us to some co very important concepts in Elaman. Therefore, it came, became expedient for Sheblon to confer those sacred things before his death upon the son Helaman, who, who was called Helaman being called after the name of his father. Now behold, all those engravings, and pay attention to that word engravings, in fact throughout most of the Book of Mormon, that, for, that word engravings has a much more significant meaning than we think. Which were in, so those engravings which were in the possession of Helaman were written and sent forth among the children of men throughout all the land, except it were those parts which had been commanded by Alma should not go forth. Nevertheless, these things were to be kept sacred and handed down from one generation to another. Therefore, in this year, they had con been conferred upon Helaman before the death of Sheblon. So it's interesting that word engravings is something we really want to pay attention to because in the ancient Israelite mindset, and especially in the prophetic traditions, engraving, while it can be something that is like uh, engraving upon a plate, carries another meaning. In the ancient Israelite prophetic tradition, the concept of engrave, engraved, engravings carries a deep, like I said, a deeper meaning than just carving out the letters on plates. It is connected to meditation or engraving on our minds and hearts, specifically the word hakach, meaning to cut or engrave. The word hach, meaning the insertion of the spiritual into the physical. It also carries connections with progression from the physical 
to the spiritual from becoming unclean from, from being unclean to becoming pure so there's a much deeper meaning when we see that idea of engrave or engraved or engravings in the Book of Mormon. So while they're literally on the Peshat level talking about a story of literal plates that were engraved, they're also connecting the things that they're talking about to a much deeper teaching regarding a change of our physical state into a more spiritual state or an idea of ascending to the upper worlds. So if we were to insert the word meditations, which is really honestly the closest thing we can get in our language in English for engravings, it would probably read something like this. Therefore, it became expedient for Shevlon to confer those sacred things before his death upon his son Helaman, who was, Helaman, who was called Helaman, being called after the name of his father. Now behold, all those meditations which were in his, the possession of Helaman were written and sent forth among the children of men throughout all the land, except it were those parts which had been commanded by Alma should not go forth. Nevertheless, these things were to be kept sacred and handed down from one generation to another. Therefore, in this year, they had been conferred upon Helaman before the death of Shevlon. This is Alma 63, 11 to 13. So if you think for a moment, and if you look at some of the prior uh, presentations I've done, here, Alma the Younger, the son of Alma, Alma the Younger, uh, symbolically is connected with the character of Melchizedek in, in his um, pattern throughout his scriptures. So Alma is a Melchizedek figure. You could actually pretty much plug in the word Melchizedek for many of his teachings, um, and, it, you're, the, I, and it's intentionally meant to be that way because his name means hidden or concealed, and he's a high priest after the Holy Order who was ordained by his father, just like Melchizedek was a high priest after the Holy Order who was ordained by his father. Melchizedek being the son of Noah, often that's at least by tradition he's referred to as Shem, son of Noah, but Alma in this case being the son of his father Alma, who was a high priest. See the pattern? See the parallels? It's like one is a mirror image of the other, and that's intentional. One is meant to mirror the other so that you can see that there is a pattern or a holy pattern, manner, or order in all things. So in the Israelite mind, meditation is the idea of bonding or becoming one with God. Alma then commanded that these meditations should be sent forward throughout the land. For what purpose? To lead the men, women, and children into a state of oneness and bonding with God. The story of Haggai gives us the prophetic introduction to the book of Helaman as a book that contains the ancient disciplines and teachings of Israelite meditation and the practice of bonding with God. So in a sense, when we're starting to look at the book of Helaman, we can look at it the literal story, and that's always the level we want to start with and maintain our foundation at. But we use that as a springboard into examining the much deeper meanings. And in this case, we're going to be looking at the ancient prophetic disciplines that are encoded into the book of Helaman to help us transform. And it follows a very ancient pattern. And we'll continue this in part two and for however long until we get through the entire book. But I, uh, I hope you'll continue to join us and stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you.